stand up for the news review of this bulletin. Iraq says it has resumed talks with the U.S. on the withdrawal of U.S.-led coalition troops from the country. An Iraqi military spokesman said the talks would be aimed at setting up a timeline for a phased pullout of coalition forces. General Yehya Rasul expressed hope that the talks could lead to an outcome soon. Senior Iraqi officials have said the end of the U.S.-led coalition was a necessity for the security and the stability of Iraq. Anti-U.S. sentiment is running high in Iraq in the face of U.S. support for the Israeli genocide in Gaza and recent deadly U.S. strikes on Iraq. Those attacks killed dozens of civilians and Iraqi security forces. The U.S. maintains some 2,500 troops in Iraq under the pretext of fighting the Daesh terrorist group, which has already been defeated in the country. Tim Anderson is the director of the Center for counter Germanic Studies, joining us from Sydney. We also have Glenn Deason, professor of political science at the University of Southeastern Norway, who joins us from Oslo. Welcome to you both. Tim Anderson, uh, so we have had these talks now resume. Uh, they had taken place, and in between the time that they initially started, uh, a couple of weeks back, I believe, until now, there was an incident where there was a targeted assassination of three members of the Qatayib Hezbollah. Uh, of which that obviously uh, speeded up things again uh, for the desire for these talks to uh, bear fruit. Do you think they will? Yes, but the U.S. is trying to keep strings attached there. Now there is a certain amount of agreement about the withdrawal of this so-called coalition uh, against Daesh, uh, which of course was assisting Daesh, as we know. It was really Hashd al-Shabi and the, the regional alliance that defeated Daesh in the region. Um, the Iraqis have known this for a long time, but they uh, made the mistake of inviting the U.S. back into Iraq in 2014, and now uh, finally the resolve is there in the government, particularly with Prime Minister al Sudani, to kick them out. But the Iraqis want to kick them out straight away. The U.S. is talking about several years of phased withdrawal and also the implementation of a new security agreement, which is going to um, be some sort of rock around their neck because uh, for sure there's already very strong U.S. links to the, the military technology and other things that intelligence and so on with the Iraqi government. And so this is a, another problem for the Iraqi government to how to kick them out without those sorts of strings attached. Well, Glenn Deason, uh, well, if uh, that's what the U.S. has in mind, um, it's probably not going to be received, uh, I'm guessing, very well from uh, the, the Iraqi side. Um, at this point, uh, when you take a look at uh, these uh, uh, targeted assassinations, which, have, uh, which are not just uh, um, something that happens uh, infrequently, let's say, um, uh, and I'm guessing that it's not something that uh, was informed uh, to the Iraqi government when it took place, that Iraq doesn't want to have its soil, as they have stated, to be used as a, as a battleground uh, to settle scores maybe with other countries, in particular, of, of course, one would be Iran. Uh, do you think that, uh, how do you think Iraq is going to proceed with these talks? Uh, I'm guessing, that, again, that they would want a result as soon as possible. Well, I very much agree. I don't think this will be well received at all. Uh, and this is a key problem for the United States. It has a huge uh, legitimacy crisis in Iraq because uh, initially, it's, of course, it said it has to remain, uh, preserve a presence in Iraq maintain uh, security, stability, uh, but of course the Iraq is already, Iraqi parliament already voted back in 2020 to have Americans leave, but of course they, they won't leave. So then the legitimacy tends to rest on the idea of fighting terrorism, uh, also the idea of self-defense uh, against its forces, which are now effectively occupation forces, given that they refuse to leave uh, when the government asks them to. So. There's a huge weakness here in international law, obviously. There's simply no foundation for the United States to leave, uh, to, sorry, to, to, to rule in Iraq or to have their troops there. So the main objective for the United States now would be to, to put in place some security agreements which would allow them to keep some influence and presence and ideally use of force within Iraqi borders. But uh, uh, this, uh, I think, would be very problematic for, for the Iraqis. Once they agree to something like this, it's going to be very hard to ever get rid of uh, the Americans on their soil. So I, I think they're going to do whatever they can to have a clean break, but they will, won't be in the streets attached at all. Well, Tim Anderson, maybe you can help us uh, figure out something here, because there's a setup 
that Iraq and the U.S. has, which, uh, which really doesn't make quite much sense. And that is the fact that the uh, international oil sales of Iraq are deposited into one single account of the New York Federal Reserve in the U.S. And uh, I think the, the figure right now is about $100 billion. Add to that the fact that the U.S. wants to uh, control Iraqi dollars outflows from the country. So in a sense, uh, some have described this as being slave to the dollar. Uh, and that obviously means the U.S. has leverage over Iraq in that respect, uh, which it can use in a variety of ways uh, and for a variety of purposes. So doesn't that uh, pretty much uh, nullify any, mm, I guess, results that the Iraqis want, in this case, uh, for them to pull out? It's another challenge for the Iraqi resistance. And of course, it, in some respects, it's not unique. There are many countries who are stuck in this position. And the dictatorship of the dollar is something that, of course, um, uh, groups like BRICS are now starting to address, and not just the dollar, but the SWIFT system and so on, and, and having deposits in US banks, as you pointed out. Um, there's also this problem of being linked into US military technology. Now, this didn't work very well for the Iraqis when uh, Daesh made its big comeback in 2014 and took over Mosul, for example, because many of the planes that the Iraqi government had bought before that weren't delivered. In other words, the US actually obstructed and did not actively participate in the campaign to kick Daesh out of Mosul. They were rather uh, sitting back and dragging their heels and using uh, Daesh as a divisive force within Iraq as they were using within Syria. Notice one other thing, that the federal system that the US encouraged in, in Iraq, uh, you know, basically creating a sectarian system and, and banning the one nationalist party in Iraq, the Ba'ath Party there, um, so effectively undermining national unity. It seems that the US wants to maintain its military presence in the north of Iraq, in the Kurdistan province. Now, this is extraordinary, even in many other federations that wouldn't be allowed because usually the central government has control over security and national boundary matters. But in this case, it seems like the US wants to maintain its base in Erbil, for example, which, as you know, is a base for the Israelis and the US carrying out various conspiracies against both Iran and Syria. They've got their proxies based there. They've got Mossad based there. So there are a few ways in which the US is trying to keep its hooks in Iraq, as well as trying to save face in terms of saying, we're not leaving because of the attacks by the by the resistance. We're moving because we've got a, an agreement for a new security agreement with the, with the Iraqis. There, the, there's this challenge for the Iraqi resistance and the Iraqi government to and get free of this net that the U.S. has cast over its country ever since the invasion of 2003. And what's going to break that, do you think, Glenn Deason? Uh, it's it's going to be hard to say because uh, I, I very much agree that this is a way for the United States. It needs to find a new source of legitimacy and uh, way of staying in Iraq. So obviously this uh, idea of pitting ethnic groups against each other uh, in order to have some autonomy for one, which it, uh, the U.S. would claim to, uh, to protect. This was how they uh, were able to start off this proxy with Syria as well. So uh, this, you know, divide and conquer, obviously a, a traditional uh, way of maintaining it. But I think also um, uh, there's an interest in transitioning to more soft imperialism. That is, instead of relying only on military force, that is to link in the Iraqis to uh, be completely reliant on various technologies, in the industries, uh, in transportation corridors, American banks, payment systems, uh, of course, the US dollar. All of this will uh, be a way of uh, effectively allowing them to have greater influence control of Iraq without the nuclear pressure. Now, uh, the wider problem, as was mentioned before, is there's a huge regional shift now away from this American. Uh, economic infrastructure. So the BRICS uh, grouping, for example, seeks to free the region from this form of soft imperialism by offering alternatives. So I think that the, the, this will be the main source of ability for Iraq to begin at some independence from, from the United States. Mm. But it's it's not going to be easy. The US is not simply going to leave Iraq uh, after all the years money and military force best to conquer it. Thank you for that, Glenn Deason, Professor of Political Science, University of Southeastern Norway, and Tim Anderson, thank you, Director of the Center for Counter-Hegemonic Studies. With that, we come to an end for this news review.